All right. Okay, so I got the, some good news and some bad news. The good news, I'm the last presenter, so we're done after this. The bad news is that I'm the last presenter, and uh, this was a really informative, at least for me, um, workshop. Uh, kudos to Fred for organizing this. Great job. <laughs> I, I sit right next to him, so I know how much effort he puts into this and his whole heart. And it's amazing that uh, you, you can do it and you, you invite people, and hopefully it's going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, it's very useful for students. I, I, I think it's, it's a good size, but it can always be get better. Uh, well, I mean, we, 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 present, we present stuff here and everybody that did for a reason, right? For people to know about it, to use them, and to use them correctly. And uh, that's what this workshop is about. So the more people they know about it, the, the better that is, right? Um, and obviously, uh, I would guess uh, an applaud would be appropriate for everyone that presented up till now, right? Because uh, you guys did a great job. Uh, I'm not prepared <laughs> for, uh, uh, I was not, I, was, I didn't know that it was uh, going to be recorded up in the internet, so I'm not as prepared. Uh, the good thing about it is that I guess it's not the most embarrassing thing on the internet about me. So, you know, I don't really care that much. Um, anyway. All right, let's get started. My name is Theo. I'm a postdoc with Chris Pack uh, at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Um, but this talk is mostly going to be uh, about, most of this talk is going to be about my PhD. And I did my PhD at the, in Los Angeles uh, at the Biomedical Engineering at the University of South California. And uh, my PhD was in Biomedical Engineering. Uh, but uh, the focus was computational neuroscience. And it was, uh, I did my PhD with uh, Dr. Vasilis Marmarelis, which is uh, quite a household name when it comes to systems uh, neuroscience. Uh, and he was a great uh, inspiration and a really good uh, advisor, and he still remains a great, great friend. Um, I'm going to talk about Volterra models, and uh, I'm going to talk about, in general, about the, the, the models, but also try to present a couple of like nice applications that uh, I did uh, over the years that I've been working with uh, with them. Um, a bit of a neural systems modeling background. It's this this map is clearly not complete, uh, but it actually touches upon a lot of things that were presented today. Um, and so system and and also it's not. Um, some people call parametric models uh, uh, what I call non-parametric and vice versa. So it's not really something to take into heart, but kind of like a, a lay of the land when it comes to neural systems modeling. Um, so we can split up our models into parametric and non-parametric. In, in the way I define parametric is that parametric uh, uh, sets that we, we have specific hypothesis about the system that we're, uh, we're modeling. So we, uh, we formulate this hypothesis in the form of uh, a multicore mental model that's, uh, 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 that's composed of differential equations, that, and uh, models such as the Hodgkin-Huxley model that was referred earlier, uh, or some uh, network uh, model formulations, firing rate models, and all that. Um, we also have the non-parametric uh, models. And the non-parametric models are kind of uh, the models that are the black box approaches that we don't really uh, try to have as, as little uh, um, assumptions about, our, about the system that we're going to model as possible. And they, again, there are non-parametric statistical entropy models, the Wiener-Boss models, and what I'm going to talk about today is the Volterra models. Uh, and then these also uh, split up, not really in the terms of the model, but how you compute it, how you estimate tho those, those uh, parameters in your model. So there's an explicit computation. Uh, Adam had like a really good uh, um, presentation on how, in general, cross-correlation or uh, spi uh, spike-triggered uh, correlations can, uh, can, uh, can be used as methods to, to explicitly compute these functionals. Uh, but also, there are, I'm going to talk about the other side, which is the orthogonal basis expansion and especially the Laguerre basis functions. All right. So 
why would you, we use non-parametric? Um, well, we don't need to know anything about the system that we will be uh, modeling, so there are no assumptions made about all the, di the, in the inherent dynamics. It has been shown uh, that is uh, robust to noise and interference, and I'm actually going to show that later. Um, it's easily extensible to accommodate uh, multiple inputs and multiple outputs, something that uh, a lot of compartmental uh, models are not really that uh, easy to do. Um, it, the size of them, in terms of parameter size, is kept at, uh, can be kept at uh, tractable levels. Um, the reason why would, would we uh, use uh, Volterra models is that they are based on a very rigorous mathematical framework. Uh, they provide uh, w a good means of evaluation of, uh, of the accuracy of the, of the model. Uh, one of the major advantages of this model is that they provide a quantitative description of the dynamics. So we can look at these uh, functionals, as that, uh, uh, the, the results and the parameters, and we can try to infer something about the inherent dynamics of the system. Um, they are scalable to an arbitrary number of uh, nonlinear orders, and we can use white noise that's non-Gaussian as well to, to, to uh, compute our, uh, our functionals. And why nonlinear? Well, I guess Adam answered that question a lot better than me. But uh, in general, nonlinearities uh, are ubiquitous and they are significant in the neural systems. Uh, and their linear approaches that do not capture these nonlinearities, obviously. Uh, they cannot sometimes reach the acquired accuracy, uh, the required accuracy, and also uh, they can come up with biased estimations of, of the functions when, when you have nonlinearities and try to only look at the uh, linear part. So um, we should be using nonlinearities for all these reasons and also because they, we can now. We can, uh, they, they, they do not come to, uh, at the forbidden computational cost. So this guy started it all. The, this is Vito Volterra. He was an Italian mathematician. Um, and he was a pretty awesome dude uh, overall. Uh, he, uh, he studied, I think, at the University of Pisa and then became a professor at the University of Turin and after that at the University of Rome around the 30s, and, uh, but uh, apart from the Volterra models and also the Lotka Volterra equations, which I'm not going to go in, but there are these pretty important predator-prey uh, differential equations uh, uh, that are used in a variety of uh, different uh, disciplines. Um, one really cool thing that he did is uh, during the 30s he was opposed to the fascist regime of Mussolini in Italy. So he was, one, he was one of the 10 professors in Italy out of the 2,000 uh, academics at that time that uh, were, were publicly against uh, Mussolini and for that he lost his job. He, he had to uh, move out of Italy and uh, he, was, uh, he was pretty adamant about it and uh, he should be recognized for that as well apart from his uh, scientific contributions. But let's move on to the science. Uh, when it comes to Vito Volterra. And what he introduced is the Volterra series. So the Volterra series are an expansion uh, on the regular linear uh, concept of a, of a system. So um, in the first line, we have the, uh, the linear, approxima the, the, the linear um, equation for, for, a, for a system, where we have the transfer function convolved with the input. Uh, and you get the output. This is a causal system, which means that each time, at each, uh, at each point in time, the output is related to the input with past uh, uh, values of input. And um, what Volterra did is expanded this to, uh, to include nonlinearities. And the nonlinearities come with these terms, uh, second order nonlinearities and third order nonlinearities. And you can see already that they have like couples of times instead of one time to go back in, in time uh, when it comes to your input. Uh, now the, the, the output is related to uh, pairs of, uh, of uh, interactions of inputs. Uh, so for the second order it's pairs, for the third order it's triplets, etc. And I'm going to go into what, what these mean. But this is in general the, the, the formulation for the Volterra series, but when it comes to uh, our 
uh, systems and uh, our data, we use the discrete Volterra series. Uh, and the discrete Volterra series is exactly the same thing, but instead of integrals, we have sums. And um, again, this is convolution. Um, we call uh, these transfer functions. And in this case, this is the linear part, and these are the nonlinear parts. We call them Volterra kernels. And uh, these are the functionals that connect the, the input to the output of the system, right? And uh, you can see that the, the linear uh, Volterra kernel is convolved with the, uh, with the input, the stimulus, let's just say, S here. And then the second order Volterra kernel is convolved with the, the product of different lags of the, of the same input of the stimulus. And um, the third order, so on and so forth. And all these are added together to produce uh, the response of our system. Um, now, to estimate it, as I said before, we can, uh, we can do uh, um, cross-correlation. We can do cross-correlation analysis-based uh, estimation. Uh, but we can also do least squares estimation, in which case you need to modify your uh, input and output data accordingly in vectors and matri matrices. Uh, that uh, you can apply a, a least square estimate at the end and come up with with the parameters of k, right, for each for each uh, point. Um, so the estimation of Volterra kernels based on least squares, at least, uh, although it's uh, it's straightforward, it's quite computational intensive, and that's because not only we're now estimating. Uh, 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 the linear part of the model, but now we have also the nonlinearities, and these add up a lot of parameters. So the explicit estimation of kernels, either through least squares, but even through uh, cross-correlation, can leave us uh, with a lot of problems because we either need a lot of data from a system that's uh, static enough that won't change through time, and this, uh, this interaction between the input and the output, or uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to end up overfitting our data by using so many parameters to, to, to fit something that's not, uh, the data are not as big as they should be. Um, and they obviously will, we will end up with an, est an increased estimation variance. Um, for, so in order to, to, cir to circumvent that problem, we can uh, estimate the kernels with a, a set of orthogonal functions that can reduce this uh, uh, computational burden. Uh, so instead of trying to estimate each point in these, in these uh, linear and nonlinear filters, what we can do is we can say that these, linear, uh, these filters come from a, a combination of uh, these orthogonal functions. And uh, these shapes can be used to reconstruct these kernels. So instead of trying to, to, uh, to estimate all these shapes uh, explicitly, we can uh, estimate the coefficients of these, uh, uh, of the, of these functions that comprise uh, these, uh, these, uh, um, these Volterra kernels. Um, and the, re the reduction for, to the computational complexity is considerable. Uh, for a third order model, uh, with a kernel memory of uh, m lax, let's just say, uh, we would require uh, uh, the estimation of, uh, well, let's, let's just get to the example right away because these, these calculations don't, don't mean much. So for a typical memory of around 50 lax, let's just say, we, will have, we, we, ha we would have to estimate 50 uh, values for uh, k1, uh, 1,300 values for k2, and 22,000 for k3. Uh, that's a lot of parameters, and you would need a lot of data to come up with uh, estimates that won't have a crazy variance uh, when it comes to uh, least squares, uh, or even uh, cross-correlation to, to come up with all the parameters. But uh, using the Laguerre expansion method, or any kind of expansion technique, for that matter, we use the Laguerre functions because uh, they have a certain shape that really works with uh, 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 physiology data in general. Uh, we have three, ex well, let's say, three expansion functions. We could even have a lot more. But uh, for this example, I'm using three. For the same exact model, we would have three values for, K, uh, for K1 for the first order kernel, six values for K2, and 10 values for K3. So this technique allows us to estimate higher order uh, uh, 
models with a lot less parameters. That means that we can use a lot less data and we can use, uh, so we can model systems that are changing through time by just getting a, a, a smaller window in time and uh, analyzing that, or we can use it uh, to uh, model systems with a lot of inputs or a lot of outputs. In general, it leaves a lot of, uh, uh, it solves a lot of our computational problems, but also gives us a lot of opportunities to, to expand this. So, I had to use this, um, my project and my PhD was part of this neuroprosthesis project, uh, the hippocampal neuroprosthesis at USC. And um, I had to uh, uh, essentially come up with uh, uh, models uh, that connect uh, CA3 hippocampal cells uh, to CA1 hippocampal cells and based on CA3 activity uh, predict what CA1 cells, uh, uh, how CA1 cells would fire. So in order to do that I had to uh, convert my Volterra models to account for point processes and the mathematical way, uh, the mathematical expression of this, of this two-stage model is here, but it's extremely simple, although it looks pretty weird. Um, it's just, a, 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 and let me see, yeah, there you go. So because I had a lot of uh, uh, CA3 uh, cells as my inputs and a lot of CA1 cells as my outputs, um, I modeled uh, this multi-input, multi-output Volterra model, and I started off with uh, uh, all the, can you see the pointer? Oh, you can, perfect. Okay, so you can see all the different inputs feeding for each output into one, the, one of these modules, this Q input, one output module. And this module is just a bunch of kernels and that get convolved with the input. They are added as a, a regular uh, multi-input uh, uh, Volterra model. And then this uh, output is passed through a trigger threshold function and it produces the output of that specific output of the CA1, let's just say, uh, neuron. Uh, and I repeat this for all outputs. Uh, the shapes of the Volterra kernels that I cover are, obviously, they, they vary a lot, but uh, these are some typical shapes. Uh, as you can see here, this is time, uh, and you can see that uh, the earliest uh, lags are the most important in this case. Um, there are second order um, Volterra self kernels, as we call them, and obviously third and fourth, uh, as high as you want. Um, the values here at the second order Volterra self kernel, as you can see, are dependent on both x and y uh, time uh, time axis, and um, they they mean something, which I'm going to uh, uh, get to it uh, in a bit, but. Um, before uh, I talk about what, what these kernels mean, I'm going to talk about how we, uh, how we evaluate how, uh, these models. And the, the model predictive accuracy is evaluated using ROC curves. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with this, but in general, it's a very simple uh, concept. The ROC curve is a plot of the uh, correctly predicted spikes over the number of true spikes, and the false spot is at the number of uh, uh, incorrectly predictive spikes over the number of the non-spike events and the number of zeros in your ones and zeros spike trains. Um, as I said before, we have the kernels, uh, we have the output and then we have this trigger threshold. So this trigger threshold can be a, a number that ranges, right? And uh, uh, as you move the threshold around, you get different points in this ROC curve and you create an ROC curve essentially by just moving the threshold up and down. And the optimal threshold, there are strategies that uh, you, uh, you can employ on, on choosing the optimal threshold. In our, in our case, it was the point closest to the one zero point, which would give us 100% true positives and 0% false positives. Um, we also uh, implemented some model statistics for the, for the model, and we used the man Whitney statistic which is really the equivalent to the area under the curve for uh, any of you that, uh, again, know ROC <laughs> analysis. Um, I'm not going to go into details on the, on the, on the man witness statistic, uh, but it does provide a, a great way to not only uh, with one number uh, um, evaluate how good 
predictively a model is, but also it gives us uh, opportunities to run statistically, statistical tests to test uh, whether one model is better than the other, whether uh, you know, one prediction is better than the other. So it's a generalized use statistics. We can and we we can assume a asymptotic normality. Uh, we can calculate the variance, and using those metrics, we can run all these statistical tests. All right. So we come up with all these models, and uh, hopefully they will be able to predict the output based on the input. Um, but what do they mean? Uh, and in general, uh, in at least in this context. The, the, these Volterra models were used to us to assess the connection between one neuron and the other. They could be used to assess a connection between a stimulus and the firing of a neuron, but in this case, and what in general I'm going to be presenting is um, what, uh, what should we do when we have to uh, come up with like a, 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 a relationship between one neuron and another one, if there is one. Um, so in general, the kernels do capture this either facilitatory or depressive effects on the output of the interaction among spikes. Uh, and they, they do that using the kernel memory. So as far as the kernels uh, span in the, in the past, they can capture all these effects and how these can affect the output. The magnitude indicates the strength of this either facilitation or, or depression. And obviously, the peak timing of these, of these, uh, of these kernels can also tell you when, uh, in the past, uh, this, this depression or facilitation uh, mattered. Um, so the zero th so in, in the formulation before, um, let me go really quick back. We have, as you can see here, a k0, a k1, k2, k3. K0 is the zeroth of the order kernel, as we said, which is, which is just a value. And then K1 is the first order, K2 second, K3 third, etc. So the zeroth order uh, kernel captures the spontaneous output activity. It's just like a, 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 a scalar that uh, uh, in general can, uh, can capture the spontaneous output activity. The first order kernel captures the effect of individual uh, past input spikes on the output. The second order kernel captures the effect of pairs. Uh, third, the effect of triplets, and so on and so forth. And to illustrate it a bit uh, more clearly, so let's say in this two input, uh, in, in the uh, Volterra model, we have one input with certain spikes at certain timings. And then input two with other spikes at other timings. And then we have a spike uh, at the output at T5. Um, so once, once we calculate uh, the, the Volterra model, and we can look back to, uh, to the kernels, we can see how, when we look at the first order kernel, we can see how individually these spikes at these different timings affect the creation of a spike in the T5 in our output. So individually how they affect. Now, when we look at second order uh, kernels, we look at how pairs of spikes uh, uh, affect the creation of a, of a spike in the output. Um, so it can be any kind of pair of so spikes, whether close or, or far, and the, the, the um, combination of these timings are reflected into this, uh, se uh, into this two, well, this two dimensional plane. Um, and uh, as I said, all, all different pairs of, uh, of spikes, and then third order for triplets and so on and so forth. So that's how the nonlinearities in the model are captured by these uh, second or third or fourth uh, order uh, uh, kernels. Um, the same goes for the second input, right? So we can have like a first order uh, uh, Volterra kernel capturing the effects of each individual spike in the second input to the creation of a spike in the output. And then obviously the second order kernel from the second input. And then we also have the cross kernels. And the cross kernels capture, as the second order kernels capture the effect of pairs of spikes in one specific input, the cross kernels now uh, capture the effect of pairs of spikes in, at different inputs. So you know how these and these interact to create uh, the spike at T5, or T2 and T5 uh, from input 2 and 1. 
in any case, this can get a bit complicated, but in general, I wanted to convey what's the idea of like this first and second order kernels and what do they really mean. Um, but uh, on top of creating these models, uh, figuring out what are the uh, connections between uh, uh, specific pairs of, uh, of neurons, um, because I expanded this methodology to a multi-input, multi-output modeling, um, I came uh, to this problem that I had to create all these different uh, models that were big, and even with the expansion, uh, uh, with the functional uh, expansions, we, uh, the, the Laguerre expansion technique, we still had a lot of inputs, a lot of outputs, and nonlinear orders. So there was this curse of dimensionality, as they call it. So I ended up with very large number of coefficients, even when I was using this orthogonal basis expansion. And I needed to employ the smallest possible amount of inputs and outputs uh, that are actually truly connected instead of just trying to brute force uh, estimate all different uh, uh, relationships and all different connections in my, uh, in my data. Um, and actually this uh, gave birth to uh, an algorithm that can also, in general, be used to, to, to uh, uh, come up with functional connectivity maps that can bear a uh, neurophysiological interpretation. So this algorithm uses the Volterra modeling methodology, the man whitney Hughes statistics, as I, uh, as, I said, as I presented them before, and it creates this functional connectivity algorithm. And the idea behind it is fairly simple. So the first step is just to rule out the, the cells that are active, whether active means that they just fire uh, above a certain threshold or they're relevant to a certain task that you're interested in or not. So we just clear out uh, all the neurons that we don't really care about. And then the second step is for, this, for each of these outputs, we compute all the one input, one output models, uh, the Volterra uh, models. And then we, we statistically compare them to what we call a random predictor through the man witness statistic. And only select those that actually are above a certain threshold and they are significant. So we test out each individual pair and see whether they are connected by themselves. And some of them pass the threshold and they seem to be connected to the output and some of them don't. So, you know, in this example, the schematic, like these two seem to be connected to the output, but for all the, the different ones, the, all the remaining uh, uh, inputs that did not pass the first test, uh, we examine whether an addition of each pair of inputs uh, can uh, have, has a statistical impact on, on the predictive ability of the initial model. So a lot of times, and well, not a lot of times, but sometimes what happens is that individual in neuron will not have a statistically significant uh, uh, a connection with the output, uh, but when it works together with another one uh, as a pair, it actually gets connected to the input and produces a, a statistically significant uh, uh, effect on the predictive ability of my model. Now, obviously the fourth step is to repeat the second and third step for all the different outputs to come up with uh, a, a a connection matrix of, of all these different uh, neurons. Um, a quick talk about the random predictor and um, how's that uh, implemented. So in order to, to assign whether we have a, a significant connection or not between two, mo two neurons, we uh, uh, perform Monte Carlo runs on, uh, with what we call a random predictor. And the random predictor is the model with the same input as the real input. But the output is, is this random, statistically independent Poisson uh, distributed uh, uh, spike train with the same fire grade as, the, as, as our real output. So when we run again and again this, uh, these, these models, we get a predictive ability for something that's not there. there these, these two, uh, the input and the output, because just, just because the output is totally random, the input and the output are not connected, obviously. So we, c we come up with uh, a, a threshold. So we need to be better, obviously, than the random predictor. So we establish this uh, cutoff value at the 95% significance uh, level after the Monte Carlo runs and calculating the man with the statistic for each one of these repetitions. 
And obviously the model is statistically significant whether when it's higher than the cutoff threshold. And we can also use this to compare two predictive models, as I said before. We can apply t-test uh, with um, uh, two uh, Marwinti statistic theta estimates. Um, and in any case, we, we use this to not only assign whether one uh, input is connected to an output, but also whether a certain model is better than the other uh, when we add or subtract outputs. So we call this Volterra functional connectivity. So is it any good? Well, we want to see uh, what, in general, uh, similar, uh, um, simpler, I would say, uh, methodologies to assign functional connectivity uh, are good for. So um, there's cross-correlation, Granger causality, and mutual information in this, uh, in this uh, matrix. Obviously, there could be more that would make my, the, the Volterra functional connectivity not as uh, nice. Uh, looking, but uh, in any case, these are these are methods that a lot of people use uh, and have been using for decades now. Um, and some of them can uh, show uh, whether the uh, a connection is directed uh, to, towards the set, so, so they can show a causality. You know, when you have uh, A connecting to B, you want to know whether the information flow is from A to B or from B to A, right? So some of them can give you that. Uh, they can give you the strength. Uh, they can tell you whether this connection is excitatory or inhibitory. Uh, they can tell you what's the timing of this connection, uh, what's at least the most, fro uh, the, 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 str the timing of the strongest effect of this connection. Um, they also uh, should ideally need as less data required to estimate as possible so that because the, the main um, hypothesis of these models is that while uh, I'm computing the, 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 for the data that I'm computing this model, my, my, my system does not change. There are no, that, so these functionals uh, will, will, should be the same across the, the time, the time that I'm, I'm using this, these data. Uh, and obviously that's not always the case, right? We, we're working with dynamical systems that change all the time. So we would like to track their changes and in order to do that we can uh, we, we can use smaller and smaller windows and track these changes across time. So we would need windows that are as small as possible. And obviously, as I said before, non-linearities would be nice to, uh, to account for. And also, what I told you before about cross-interaction. So a lot of times, neurons don't work together to produce an output. They work uh, 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 interacting each other and they, 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 they create the output. So that would be a nice uh, feature. And uh, well, obviously, the Volterra function just does great at all of these things. Uh, but don't take my word. Um, because in general, Volterra models, and that's the base of this Volterra function connectivity, are very, very versatile. Throughout decades, have been used for modeling of uh, neurosensory systems from the vertebrate retina, the invertebrate retina, uh, auditory nerve fibers, all these are published data in books and, and journals. Uh, uh, spider mechanoreceptor, um, but also they have uh, been used in uh, the cardiovascular system, in cerebral hemodynamics, blood flow, autoregulation in the renal system, metabolic uh, endocrine system, the glucose metabolism and control of it. Uh, I personally have been using them in uh, rat hippocampal slice preparation data. I've used them in uh, hippocamp uh, hippocampal data, as I showed you before, uh, in vivo rat hippocampus from CA3 to CA1. I've used them in the human temporal cortex uh, extracellular recordings uh, and to figure out LFP spike uh, uh, relationships. And I've used them in uh, the primate visual cortex in V4 and MT. And I've also used them in Bixi data, just playing around, uh, because Bixi has this um, has uh, publicly available data on uh, how many uh, bikes are in each uh, station at each point in time uh, for uh, at the resolution of one minute, I think. And you, these are accessible data; you can go and download them and play around with them. So I did for whatever reason, and. <laughs> 
So I, I found that uh, these models are actually pretty good to predict uh, how, many, how many bikes a specific uh, um, uh, station would have uh, based on the, uh, on the bikes that it had half an hour before. Uh, and uh, it could predict with a, with a prediction of like one plus minus one bike uh, exactly how many, uh, uh, how many bikes it would have. So that was pretty cool. But I didn't really do anything with it. I just played around and left it. Maybe I should. Anyway, so they are quite versatile. You can use them in like a lot of different contexts and uh, different data. Um, but also, uh, I've run some simulations to, to establish that these, these models are, are good and they can uh, uh, compute actually accurate representations of the dynamics. So uh, I made this example of a four input system. Uh, four, three of the four inputs are connected to the output through certain functionals. Um, and they have different uh, firing rates for uh, uh, the, 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 diff the four different inputs. Three of them, as I said before, are connected to the output, so X3 is not. And uh, I, I started applying different kinds of noise in the, in the input, so to see whether I'm recovering uh, uh, the, the, the functionals uh, um, in an accurate way using this, uh, this methodology. So. So the model estimation, and I'm going to show you a couple of cases, works great with various noise cases and for 50% spurious spikes. So if I um, add random spikes in my input and output up to 50% level, it still works. Uh, we, I can start moving around spikes with a maximum of four lakhs displacement, and it's still going to work in terms of finding at least which inputs are connected to the output and uh, saying that x1, x2, and x4 are connected and x3 is not, obviously. Um, we can also delete spikes, 30%. We can misalign spikes so we can take some spikes from x4 and put them to x3. All these things can happen, actually, in your physiological recordings. You can miss spikes. You can have spikes from other stuff that you don't really care. You, you, there might be uh, some spikes that you're going to lose or um, miss uh, um, when you do spike sorting. You can, you can sort some spikes that belong to one neuron to another one and vice versa. So these were, I was trying to, to, to emulate extreme cases of really, really bad data and whether, you know, the, uh, the, the algorithm would work. And obviously in the noise free, it works pretty well. It, uh, not only says that X3 is uh, not connected and X1, X2, and X4 uh, are connected, uh, but also it recovers the shapes pretty well, but it's a noise-free case, so I mean, I, I would have a problem if I wasn't doing well here, but when I add 25%, again, um, you can see here the estimated theta, by the way, and, uh, okay, there you go, and the estimated theta should be better than the 95% cutoff value, right? Uh, which is close to chance, by the way. And uh, you can clearly see that X1, X2, and X4 are better, are better, and X3 is right around there, so the input is not as significant. And again, when we add the noise, um, the estimates of my kernels are, are pretty good of the functions of the different uh, uh, interactions that are required to uh, get that specific uh, output are uh, very well recovered. In the 50% spurious case, again, uh, the, the model seems to identify the right inputs, and most of the shapes of the, of the kernels are there to, pre to be preserved, apart from some uh, nonlinear kernels, but still, you know, we're doing pretty good. Uh, in terms of prediction accuracy and also uh, uh, coming up with, uh, with the functionals. Um, I think this is not 50%. Okay, I forgot to change the, uh, this part. So I think this is uh, the case of the jitter, the, the four lakh jitter, where again, uh, we have corrupt, corrupted inputs and outputs, but still we can uh, come up with the right estimates. And then we have deleted spikes, misaligned spikes, all the times 
you know, the, the algorithm works pretty well no matter what you throw at it, which means that it can actually capture the main parts of, of, of the system. Um, and also, as I said before, we can use this uh, the same type of idea not only to add inputs or uh, remove inputs, but also to select our model order, order, which is something that we need to do at a certain point. We need to, de to define. We cannot use an arbitrary amount of, of nonlinearities. You know, at a certain point, we need to stop. So in our case, you know, even a second order model, uh, second order model, was doing just fine. Adding a third order didn't really give us any kind of uh, uh, predictive power. Uh, and also, you need to uh, select how many of these functions, of these Lager like functions, uh, these sort of normal functions, you're going to use to estimate your your kernels. So, again, here it seems that three is the right number. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to brush through all the results that I have. They don't really matter that much anyway. I just wanted to show you. Uh, some shapes and what can you get from from all these uh, uh, from these methods? Um, this is an, an example from the CFSA1 uh, uh, models uh, of the RAT hippocampus. Uh, the RAT was uh, trained to perform uh, this uh, non uh, this sample to non match task, which is a recall task. He, he hits a lever and then he needs to remember which one he hit and hit the other one, um, and uh, we come up with uh, pretty good uh, uh, estimates of, uh, of the connections between CA3 and CA1. Uh, and we know that because when we plot the actual firing of CA1 cells and the predicted one, they actually match pretty well. And that happens again and again. I, I didn't include all of them. But uh, it's, it's working pretty well. Part of it is that it's you know either a monosynaptic or a a bisynaptic connection. So it, there's not a lot of things going on there in terms of the complexity, but there are still, we're, tra we're trying to predict the occurrence of spikes at the level of milliseconds. So that's pretty hard. And I don't know if any of you guys try to do that. You're not uh, getting that great prediction uh, when you're trying to, to, to predict spikes at the level of milliseconds rather than smoothing it out with a, f a firing rate window, Gaussian window, or whatnot. Um, we also come up with connectivity maps. Uh, as I told you before, when we figure out which uh, neuron is connected to which, we can also tell how strongly they are connected. Uh, and during different behavioral events, we can... I can't really see. There are some, like, fainter ones that you can't see. You can only see the very strong ones, but you can kind of see these little, little light ones. And there are others that are very faint that obviously you cannot see. Um, but yeah, the, the connections, some of them quite change, some of them don't. You, we can run uh, uh, graph theory statistics on them and uh, come up with some interesting um, uh, results on how these connections work. We can uh, come up with connectivity maps for different days of experiments. So how do these change? And they change quite a lot through, through, during different consecutive days of recordings of the same exact rat using, doing the same exact thing. Um, and we can come up with aggregate uh, connectivity maps for specific animals and see how these change across animals. And obviously, these change even more. Um, and OK, I'm going to skip through all these. And also, I'm just going to show you, I think, showing. OK, you can see something. An example where. Uh, we used the same exact idea, but now instead of using the CA3, CA1 connection, which we know that CA3 is the input and CA1 is the output, I, I recorded uh, using the uh, user array from V4, from private V4, uh, private V4, and um, we didn't really know which one, which neurons were the inputs and which ones uh, were the outputs, so I just had to uh, consider every single neuron as a possible output and a possible input as well. Um, and we come up with uh, some connectivity maps that most of the times don't really make sense, but uh, sometimes when you start grouping connections and seeing different directions and excitatory versus inhibitory and all these interesting things, you can come up with some cool stuff. Uh, in this case, just during uh, uh, regular 
uh, receptive field mapping stimulation, we can come up with these connectivity maps where 65% uh, of, the, of, the, of the connections that we compute are excitatory, 35 are inhibitory, 18% um, of them uh, uh, would not appear if we were only looking at uh, linear, we were only computing the linear models instead of nonlinear. So there is a value in adding nonlinearities, and you know, in this case, that's about it. And 7% of them would not appear if we weren't accounting for, for cross interactions. What I told you before that one neuron can, uh, can seem, to be not, seem to not be connected to a specific uh, other neuron, but when you, you uh, include in your model another one uh, working uh, cooperatively, then you, you'll get a significant connection there. Um, so 7% of, of those connections seem to uh, uh, be assigned to cross interactions. Um, I can't remember what's this. <laughs> I think it's the strength of excitatory and inhibitory connections. Uh, yeah, the histograms of the strength. So you can come up with all these different uh, metrics. I also ran some uh, experiments where I was looking at, uh, uh, again in V4, uh, neurons and how the, these connections change when uh, you uh, stimulate only the center of receptive fields of neurons uh, and when you start uh, stimulating the surround. Uh, for those of you that don't know, surround suppression is a common uh, property of, visual, of some visual neurons where um, when you increase the, the stimulus size at a certain point, instead of increasing their firing, they actually start decreasing. So their, their firing gets suppressed by this uh, area around the receptive field that's suppressing the fire, right? And um, the bigger the stimulus gets, the more the firing is suppressed. Uh, so we had this, uh, uh, th we, ha we have this array recording from all these uh, uh, neurons in V4. So we can calculate what we call the surround suppression index, which is for each neuron how much of, his, of its firing gets suppressed when the, the stimulus gets bigger and bigger. Um, and you can see here, we have a bunch of cells here where they have a, a very big surround suppression index, which means that these cells uh, get, have a very strong surround that, uh, that suppresses their, uh, their firing to almost, uh, to almost 100%. Uh, and then we have uh, a bunch of uh, neurons here in the array where we don't really have a, a very strong surround. Um, so, when we come up with, when we calculate these functional connectivity uh, maps uh, for periods of time where we don't invoke the surround, so when we do not have surround suppression, we have a, a map just as we have uh, in general with the regular uh, RF mapping uh, experiment. But when we actually uh, invoke surround suppression, you can see that, and I don't know if you noticed, but the blue connections are actually taking over the whole, uh, this connectogram, let's just say, uh, which means that, you know, that we have a lot more uh, inhibitory connections uh, than excitatory. Before uh, the surround suppress, before invoking surround suppression, the percentage was 66 to 34. After it, it actually inverts to 48 to 52 percent of the connections uh, estimated which means that uh, the part of the surround suppression might be um, caused by lateral uh, connectivity. And I mean, that's not an extremely conclusive result, but at least that's, that's what we find here in terms of the functional connections. And the reason why I'm, I'm well, I'm going to go through these because we also calculated the connectivity maps that don't even show here uh, based on eye movements, and we find some interesting stuff there but that doesn't really matter that much. All right, to conclude, uh, I presented this modeling approach that's uh, multi-input, multi-output. I have to say it's deterministic, that, uh, it, that there's no probabilistic part of it, which a lot of people don't like, but I kind of do, because I want to know that when I, uh, when I enter an input, I will. I know what to expect that I'm going to get. Uh, again, it can be easily uh, converted to uh, to have some probabilistic aspects to it. Um, this uh, modeling framework is broadly applicable, as I showed, and it's been shown. Uh, 
and there are minimal assumptions that are, uh, need to be made. It is robust in the presence of noise in the data. It is computationally efficient. All these uh, 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 computations and functional connectivity maps were uh, computed with regular laptops and uh, desktops that are not really supercomputers. Uh, and uh, we can use short data to, uh, to come up with, uh, with these functional connections. They are scalable to an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs, as I showed. And uh, the model emphasis is, in general, on predictive abilities. But just because we have a, 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 an, Im an image of the, of the functionals that describe the shapes that describe the connection, we can also say whether it's excited or inhibitory, what moment in time it actually matters, and uh, uh, various di different details. Um, and you know, this functional connectivity algorithm explores nonlinear dynamics and all these you know benefits. Which, uh, well, if you're not confused, uh, if you're not, uh, um, if I didn't convince you up till now, whatever I'm going to say now, it won't matter that much. But it is directed, as I said before, it's computationally tractable. Um, what I want to say is that the functional connections are not equivalent to an anatomical connection, so obviously. Uh, we are sampling from a subset of neurons. Uh, we are sampling from, from usually a specific area, not. Uh, a lot of different areas. And um, there are some known problems in all functional connectivity algorithms that are uh, um, related to indirect inputs or common inputs. And for whoever is interested, we can talk about it later. But functional connections are still important. Uh, they can reveal uh, general properties of lateral interactions. They uh, can reveal this uh, flow of uh, information in, uh, in certain circuits. And uh, you can actually publish in pretty good journals with uh, these functional connectivity studies. Um, this list actually is not representative. There are a lot more pretty good uh, uh, papers that have been published before using functional connectivity. So uh, for anyone that wants to use either a simple Vortera model uh, and its uh, estimation through uh, uh, least squares or the Volterra function connectivity algorithm, um, I have the code available. I can give it to Fred. I don't know if you want to upload it somewhere as well. Sure. Sure. Okay. That's good. But also you can email me for questions or anything you want. All right. Thank you. Time, right? <laughs> I hope it's not going to take an hour to answer. That is true. Yeah, they have to be orthonormal in general, so they have to have some mathematical properties to, 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 to be used. Yeah. They need to be orthonormal, not only orthonormal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The orders of the nonlinear non orders, right? So the nonlinear the, the the functions that you use to estimate the kernels do not depend on the nonlinear orders. The fu the functions that you the Laguerre functions or whatever uh, exp expansion functions you want to use, uh, you have a certain si uh, number that you use to estimate all of them, all all the different uh, uh, Volterra kernels. So the first, the second, the third, you know. The good thing about this is. If I want to have a system that has 10 lags, or 100, or 1,000 lags, uh, if, when I use 3, or 5, or 10 uh, expansion functions, this, these are, they, they, can they can extend to 10, 100, or 1,000 lags if I want them to. So ex expanding especially the memory of the system will not increase my parameter space. It actually stays the same. 
the, the, the memory stays the same. So there, are, uh, there is one parameter that you need to be careful with when it, when it comes to estimating Volterra models, and that's the, well, with expansion uh, methods, which is the alpha. Uh, in this case of the Laguerre functions, it's the spread of the, how far it goes. So let me go back and show you. Oh, man, that's going to take a while. But um, the Laguerre functions have a certain shape, and that's why actually they're, they were chosen as a good uh, uh, expansion. All right, so, like, so that's, that's a problem that has been solved before I even started my PhD, so I was like handed over the solution. The reason why we use Laguerre fu uh, uh, functions is that they have like these really nice shapes. You can't really see all of them. You can only see the first and, and the second one. Uh, but you have the first Laguerre uh, uh, um, shape is this, the, like, the first Laguerre function, and then the second one is this, and the third one gets a bit more wavy. You can't really see it. But uh, in general, they have exponential uh, uh, decay, so uh, you know that's, that's a typical uh, dynamic of uh, any kind of physiological system. They have uh, undershoots, overshoots, feedbacks, uh, they have, uh, uh, they, they can, th in general, they've been shown that they are pretty, a pretty good set of orthonormal expansion functions to be used in, in physiological systems. Um, so yeah, that, you know, I kind of like took that and, and moved on to, to expand this methodology. Yeah. I actually went through that, but uh, in general, no, 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 it's fine. It's, I, I know I'm the last one, <laughs> so, you know, I'm actually surprised that you actually have questions, too. I, I was expecting to hear snoring <laughs> in general. But, um, no, the, we can actually uh, select the, the order of the model based just on the building successive uh, models and seeing how they fare in terms of their predicted value, and then comparing them statistically and say, well, if I add the second order, my model gets better. If I add the third order, does it get better? In this case, not. Sometimes it actually matters. So, without, um, well, what you could do is compute a huge model with like a lot of different nonlinear orders, and then see inside in the statistics of the model itself, and see whether some parameters are actually are, do not have any kind of uh, uh, effect, and then you and then you minimize it that way. Uh, but in our case, just because we had so many inputs, so many outputs, so many orders, cross interactions, this and that, I, I couldn't build one model that would include everything and then start subtracting. So I had to build it slowly and, and come up with the final model. Um, well, I mean, again, like this, uh, this uh, example uses three. Uh, I would assume not, not more than ten. I mean, by, by, but like again, it, it all depends on your system and your and dynamics inside of it. The more, the, the higher number. So, in general, uh, um, a rule of thumb to use when you're uh, using the these functions is that uh, the more oscillatory your system, so your system is. Uh, the more Laguerre like, functions you will need when it's slowly decaying, when it doesn't have that much fast dynamics, lower uh, number of Laguerre like, functions should do just fine. But again, like this stuff you can, you know, you don't have to uh, st stick by one number that you just uh, came up with uh, arbitrarily. You can actually test well, what's, the, what's the best number, what's the best uh, model order. All right, thank you.